Hey YouTube, David Staples, back with another video. So today we're going to be going through some CompTIA Security Plus practice questions. Uh, I know that there's a bunch of things that we typically cover in courses that uh, you may or may not necessarily see on the exam. Of course, we never know exactly what you're going to see. Uh, but in helping some of the students prepare for the uh, exams, I figured I'd go ahead and give you guys a, a few extra practice questions uh, that you can go through. And even if you're not in my classes, feel free to go through these. Uh, these are definitely some really good examples of some things that you might expect to see on an exam. Uh, obviously, I'm not copying the exact questions and answers uh, from the exams, but uh, having had students come back recently and ask about certain things, I wanted to make sure that these are things that you guys are very comfortable with and familiar with uh, to be able to go and pass your exam. So let's go ahead and get started, shall we? So question number one, ANS company needs to be able to abide by regulations in their industry requiring that once data is written to an application that it cannot be overwritten. So what solutions should ANS consider implementing? Is it A, database column level encryption, B, worm drives, C, IPsec, or D, incremental backups? So I'll give you a few seconds to think through the answers here and then go ahead and forward on to the answer and we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. So if you answered B, you're absolutely correct. This is worm drives. So a worm drive is a write once, read many drive. Uh, of course, database column level encryption is certainly a very good idea for our databases, but here when we're looking at writing data that cannot be overwritten, that we are specifically looking at these worm drives here. So question two, Igor has logged into a Linux server via SSH. He needs to figure out which router's traffic is traversing when communicating with the remote network. What command does he need to run? And of course, the four answers are down below here. I'll let you read them for yourselves, and we'll talk about the answer in a moment. So of course we've got A is trace route, B is also trace route, C is netstat, and D route follow. Well, we know that the command that he wants to run is a trace route. However, on a Windows machine, we actually kind of abbreviate it just with trace RT. But since we're on a Linux machine, this is actually going to be fully written out as trace route, the full words, T-R-A-C-E-R-U-T-E. -E. So if you answered A, you're absolutely correct here. So we'll move on to question number three. Simon needs to ensure that his Windows workstation has received the correct DHCP configuration. What command can he run on the CLI to verify the current configuration? So we know that ifconfig is a Linux or Unix or Mac command. Uh, since we specifically said that we're on a Windows workstation, we want to verify the DHCP configuration, of course, being the IP address, the subnet mask, the default gateway, and everything that get assigned. And so, of course, this is going to be shown under our ipconfig command. And, of course, CLI is the command line interface. So this is where it's very important to know your acronyms for this particular exam. So moving on to question four, Gar Garfield needs to run a command as administrator on a Linux machine one time, even though he does not have the root password. What command can he use to perform this action? Okay, so if we're at the command line interface, we know that we don't really right click, right? So we can immediately eliminate A. D is also just a uh, thing that we're just using to kind of throw you off here. So uh, the choices we've got are sudo or su. Well, with su, do it, you do actually need the root password to be able to run this, and this will actually take you into basically the root account to be able to perform however many commands you need to. So the key here was a one-time command that he needs to run in addition to not having that root password, so we can actually use the sudo command. So a user, so long as they're on that sudoers list, can actually go ahead and run a command as the root user, uh, assuming that, again, they do have the appropriate permissions here. 
So the correct answer for this one, obviously, is going to be B, pseudo. Uh, question number five. Gene is tasked with implementing multi-factor authentication at the entry doors of the data center. Which of the following meet the new standard criteria? So if we take a look at A, B, and C, we notice that, yes, there are two different types of authentication here, but there's still single factor authentication. A retina scanner and handprint geometry scanner, of course, are both biometric types of authentication. Key fobs and proximity badges, again, a single factor. These are both something that you have. A pin code and password, both something that you know. But a pin code, of course, is something that you know. A fingerprint reader is something that you are. And so, of course, this is going to be something that does meet the requirements for multi-factor authentication. So question number six. Bob needs to configure the new branch office network to include the strongest level of security possible. Which of the following should he configure? So hopefully you're able to eliminate C and D just right off the bat. This comes down to A and B. So CCMP we know is combined with AES in our WPA2. And then disable SSID broadcasting. Well, yes, this is a good idea perhaps if you want to hide the network from your normal average user. But keep in mind that uh, because the SSID is still actually broadcast in a certain form, that you don't actually really use this as a strongest level of security. The strongest level of security, of course, is still going to be using encryption. And of course, that's going to be with the CCMP uh, with AES, which is under WPA2. So we'll move on to question number seven. Uh, Tori has noticed that a number of users throughout her organization have downloaded all sorts of programs, including versions of Solitaire and other games that are not approved. What should Tori implement? So when we're talking about application whitelisting and blacklisting, we know that we can automatically get rid of uh, both A and C, right? There is things like you know, gray box testing and whatnot, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about a blacklist and a whitelist. So with a blacklist, we simply specify, here are the programs that are not allowed. But with a whitelist, we're specifying, here are the only programs that are allowed. So if we want to be the most restrictive, or if we want to implement the most restrictive policy that we can, the whitelist, of course, is going to be what we need. Uh, obviously, we can't go through and list every single piece of freeware and shareware out there uh, that we would need to implement a really good blacklist. So the whitelist is going to be the best option for this particular question. So moving on to question eight. Bob wants to prevent potential attackers from being able to ping sweep his network. Which protocol should he block in his firewall? So this is where, again, knowing those acronyms will come in really handy because we know that ICMP is the Internet Control Message Protocol. SNMP is our Simple Network Management Protocol. IGMP is the Internet Group Management Protocol. And TOTP is Timed One-Time Passwords, or Time-Based One-Time Passwords. Either way works. So we can elim eliminate D automatically. Uh, SNMP we know is not really used for pings. IGMP is used for multicasting. Uh, ICMP, however, Remember, we have an ICMP echo request and an ICMP echo re reply. So if we block ICMP in our firewall, someone won't be able to actually ping whatever systems we actually have on our network. So the correct answer here is going to be A, ICMP. So moving on to question number nine. Alice is concerned that her coworker has been writing down her password on a sticky note and attaching it to the side of her monitor. What type of policy should be in place to prevent this scenario from happening? So we know that an acceptable usage policy tells us what we can and cannot do on our network or with our computer systems. 
The password policy, yes, it should define things like how long the password uh, has to be at minimum, uh, perhaps a minimum age, a maximum age, how often it has to be changed, uh, maybe the strength as far as you know, uppercase characters, lowercase characters, numbers, and whatnot. But typically, we're not going to include this in our password policy. Typically, this is actually going to be part of our clean desk policy, which basically states that you shouldn't be leaving anything confidential or private on top of a desk where someone else could possibly see it. So the correct answer here is going to be C, our clean desk policy. So our last question for this set, question number 10, Bobo has decided to join the circus, and the circus has a BYOD policy that requires them to allow the ability to perform all but which of the following? So hopefully you chose phone call recording. We know that remote wipe and GPS tracking are definitely very common with BYOD policies. Uh, require a strong password is definitely something that a lot of companies will implement as well. Phone call recording, you're not typically going to see anything like this with any sort of BYOD policy. Uh, we do still want to maintain the privacy of our employees, making sure that they're able to you know, carry on a telephone conversation. Uh, and as well, most of us don't have the type of capabilities like the NSA to actually sit there and go through all these telephone calls and listen for specific things to be... Uh, specific things in that conversation or, or whatever. So the correct answer here, of course, is going to be C. So I hope you guys enjoyed the practice questions here. If you've got any questions, feel free to leave them in comments down below or send me a message. Uh, I will come out with some more here at some point very soon. Uh, as well, I'm in the process of writing a book for the next Security Plus exam, which is out uh, due out in a couple of months or so. Uh, so when I have that finished, I'll be sure to list a link down in below in the description. Uh, in the meantime, there is another book out for the current exam uh, that I certainly would recommend, so I'll go ahead and put a link down in the description for that one as well, and uh, certainly hope you check that out. Uh, feel free to go ahead and get a copy of it if you're looking at taking the 401 anytime soon. Uh, otherwise, I know the 501 is coming out this October, and uh, look forward to seeing some of that new test material, some of the new questions, and uh, be happy to help you guys out any way that I can. And uh, in the meantime, check out my other videos, leave a comment down below, and be sure to click on that subscribe button. I uh, look forward to seeing you soon. You guys take care.